to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast with Borg, Betts, and a baller. Welcome in. Corporate's not here. It's Wednesday, April 17th. It's just Borg and Betts. Dude, they couldn't even show up for work today. I mean, come on. Let's let's be real. These guys, they are just hanging us out to dry, man. The, the Dynasty crew, they need it. They need their, their Jason. They need their Mike. But they said, you know, we're taking the day off. You got to hang out with Borg and Betts, and, uh, and we're sorry about that. I'm just tired of the corporate lackeys, you know, the, the people that, the, the higher the suits. ups. Yeah, I mean, we know if there's anybody that's wearing a suit today, you know, it's the three of them, Jason, birthday suit, and whatever he's doing today. <laughs> uh, no, the guys are actually in L.A. for a couple of days, got some some big, even more corporate meetings. I mean, imagine that, our corporate people talking to other corporate people, and it's just a bunch of noise. Instead, you and I said that it's still dynasty season. It's almost the NFL draft, so imagine not giving the people what they want. I mean, it, it's sick. It really is. Dude, this, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Like, every year this happens where you get to a point and you're like, okay, yeah, like, it's March. Okay, yeah, it, it's finally April. The NFL draft's coming up, and all of a sudden it's like, it's next week. Like, the NFL draft is here, man. So I'm excited. I can't wait to see where these rookies go. Um, there was just a very big-time mock draft dropped uh, for the industry this week, which we'll kind of touch on, I'm sure, throughout the day today. So there's just wild scenarios that are going to play out over the next two weeks and and i'm excited on this show we're going to talk about the players that have the most to lose or gain in the nfl draft so we'll be focusing more on veterans because in just a hot second we'll have landing spots we'll get to talk about those every single year i look at a lot of articles that are winners and losers we do shows that are winners and losers uh, on the main show right afterwards we kind of you know recap but it's interesting because it's very easy to assign certain players as they're clear winners. They didn't draft this position. But then when you look at actual fantasy production, it doesn't always equate. I'm thinking of running backs over the last couple of years that escaped the draft with like the team didn't take anyone. This must mean they love him. Miles Gaskin. Do you remember that year with the Dolphins? It was like, oh, well, sure do. clearly this seventh round player that like had like a, a good hot streak. They love this guy. And they're going to ride this guy. A couple years ago, same thing. Devin Singletary had a really awesome streak at the end of the of the playoffs. And we're like, oh, cool. He's the guy. They take James Cook in the second round. Last year, Damian Pierce. He's oh. clearly the guy. They love him. They didn't take anyone else. And instead, uh, if you have Damian Pierce or you traded for him, it feels like just a hot fart at this point. That <laughs> you, you don't regret, but you do... You have the after effects. It's it burns. Oh, you regret that. There's a hundred percent chance you regret that if you have him on your. I team. I don't know that feeling because I would never have him on my team ever. Oh, imagine, imagine ever doing that. No, if, if obviously this show wasn't around when when he came out of school, but Kyle, for you know, as soon as anything is cool in in anything, but especially in fantasy football, people get onto a guy. He's like, we got to poke holes. Like, why we can't be into this guy? So as soon as Damian Pierce was like in redraft leagues, like. A fifth round pick he was like nope i am out on this guy and um it's a good reminder that draft capital matters especially to uh gms and head coaches correct and in case you're one of those people who think i just sniff my own farts i mean i traded for alexander madison in a couple of leagues this past year so it's not all roses whoops <laughs> whoops <Yeah. laughs> uh especially at the running back position but we will talk about players with uh you know some some things to gain And some depth charts that are just gross. I can't wait to talk about one of these teams that when I did a deep dive, I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? Uh, I guess this this keeps me employed, like that I'm doing my job. That's basically why I'm doing it. And then we'll hopefully get to hop in the mailbag and answer some listener questions. If you want all the rankings, you can go to udkplus.com, our startup rankings, our rookie rankings. And in just a week, we will get to do a makeover of the rookie rankings in our mock draft. So those people that are, if you're out there and you're super thirsty, you're saying, I need super flex rankings for my league. Do I need to take a quarterback at 101? Well, we'll talk about that. We'll even talk about positional needs too, uh, because I think that's tough for people to figure out where do you go with that. So udkplus.com, you can get in on the 2024 Ultimate Draft Kit Plus. And then, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a moment, bets because you don't just get the Dynasty Pass. 
you get the DFS pass. And we're already starting to crank out stuff for that. But we always joke that corporate, in all their meetings, they forget that they're actually charging people next to nothing for the DFS pass. Yeah, it's it's something. I'll tell you what, it's a strategy <laughs> that they've decided to take. Um, it's so good, man. You know, it's it's really wild that every year we get to a point in the summer and it's like, all right, UDK Plus launch, here it comes. You know, the UDK is available June 1st. Oh yeah, and you also get the DFS pass. And, and it's like, what? A couple dollars extra, if you think about it from, from the cost standpoint. Um, so honestly, the UDK Plus, which if you're in the Dynasty, gets you that aspect of it, the Dynasty pass. But also if you're playing DFS this year, um, or want to bet on props, stuff like that in season, it's the exact same price <laughs> to get the UDK plus, which, you know, is terrible business, uh, business modeling. So what do we know? We're just a couple of guys talking about fake football, but I would say it's, a, it's a steal. Yeah. So UDK plus.com. We're not going to have a quick question because we're just going to jump right into it because Jason's not around. Mike's not around. We don't have to talk to them. Dig deeper, y'all. Let's go. Another example of corporate not being around. Just use whatever drops I want. We will talk about the players with the most to lose or gain. And there are some obvious names that I think we should just mention. And then we'll go get into the meat, the thick of this. Because right now, we don't really know how the Dallas running back room is going to shake out. I think you and I are on the same page about this. It's probably not Rico Dowdle. But if you're holding on to him in Dynasty, I think we would both say it's time to trade him away. I mean, that ha- the time to trade him away was a month ago. But Check. You've, got, <laughs> you've got um, basically one week to do that for anything. Not that anyone's going to give you anything that's like meaningful, but including him as like an add-in on a trade piece or something like that. Yeah, they're drafting a running back, no doubt. They've met with... Jonathan Brooks, Trey Benson, um, a, a couple others. Like the, they're taking one somewhere in this draft, and there were also rumors, you know, even before the NFL draft season started approaching, of like maybe they just bring Zeke back, you know, for one more cheap year. Like it's just not Rico Dowdle, right? He's not that player. So yeah, he's probably a good hold for like a backup role that you maybe get something in terms of injury. But if you can get anything an early third, like yeah, I'm trading him away immediately. I was doing a deep dive on Zeke because last year his elusive rating was basically the bottom of the barrel. Uh, Wasn't very good. But then I went back and I was just reminding myself, Zeke wasn't just like good for fantasy. He was great for like a five to six year stretch, which is not normal for a running back. So I just was like, I forget that the Zeke that we once knew was a fantasy powerhouse. But yeah, I I think with Dallas, it's going to change. So we're not going to dwell too much on that one. Arizona, like they're going to draft a wide receiver. So whatever you think about Greg Dortch or Michael Wilson, they're just dudes. And and Greg Dortch is a really fun dude in the NFL. But in, apart from like full PPR leagues, it's probably not going to be there very much longer, especially with Trey McBride. Michael Wilson had some good moments against zone coverage last year. He has maybe the lowest number against man coverage of anybody I've ever seen in my life in all of my spreadsheets. So he's just a dude too. He was a really old prospect, right? Yeah, he was a grad uh, student coming out, grad transfer. Uh, You know, with him, it's it's still wild to me. And obviously this is our dynasty show, but if those of you that play best ball too, like he's still being drafted in like the 14th round of best ball leagues. I'm like, what is happening? Like they are taking a wide receiver and not just a wide receiver, one of the best wide receiver prospects probably that we've seen in a while, whether it's you know, Marv, Neighbors, or Adunze, like they're taking one of those guys, it seems almost certain. And now you're adding in Trey McBride into the mix, right? So I just don't see the path where Michael Wilson ever is kind of what you need. So again, a guy that I'd be trying to get off my roster if I can get anything that's, you know, a, a meaningful value for that. Buffalo wide receivers are interesting if they're on your roster. I have Khalil Shakir on a roster. I actually traded Curtis Samuel away a couple of weeks ago after he signed. That was before the Diggs news. Right now, they're minus 280 to take a wide receiver. Every single mock is going to have, you know, A.D. Mitchell or Brian Thomas Jr. as as that's the spot. And maybe they trade up from there. But what would you be doing with these two players? And is Samuel somebody that you still can hold? Or is like his short area targets are going to end up being Dalton Kincaid targets? And at the end of the day, it's like 
yes, he signed a three-year contract, but like for fantasy, how much of a difference maker is he going to be when they add a hopefully an alpha? Yeah, and I think they're they're going to like you said. You know, he was a guy we talked about. I don't know, a month and a half ago, maybe a month ago, somewhere in that range of like, this signing means a lot to me because of his connection with Joe Brady. So like, I think he's going to have a role in the offense. But Stefan Diggs had a role in the offense with Joe Brady, and he was like the wide receiver 50 right when that happened. So I like him from a dynasty standpoint of like, you had him on your roster, he lands with a great quarterback in a great offense, and you're excited about those things. But let's be real, if someone wants to to trade for him from me, I am not attached to Curtis Samuel for obvious reasons. Um and again, I think the best ball markets I think right now are like a good way to sense like how excited people are about certain players. Curtis Samuel frequently goes in the top 90 picks overall. So like people are very excited about this player. And when you think about when breakouts happen, when guys reach a ceiling, it is not at this point in their career. So we know what Curtis Samuel is. So I think it's an incredible time to try to trade him away if someone is talking themselves into the idea of he's at worst the wide receiver too for Josh Allen, you know, and I'm using that as a selling point. I think he's one of the better trade away targets if you can get something for him in return. All right. One more. That's kind of an obvious one. Jonathan Mingo did nothing on the NFL football field last year in terms of mattering for dynasty purposes. Like it's rare for a wide receiver to be taken 39th overall and to plummet this much in a year in terms of value. Usually, players hold their value, and we go, oh, I, I can see a scenario. Um, across the board, just so many red flags. 0.78 yards per route run is atrocious. Uh, I've given the total of it. If you're below 0.8, you like don't exist anymore. Like You shouldn't. It doesn't matter. Um, it's the worst of any round one through three wide receiver with 75 plus targets. It's really that bad. The offense was that bad. Now you might say it can only go up from here. There also is a third scenario called uh, they just stay the same and they just remain not that great. He's not a separator. So Jonathan Mingo is one of those players that might be tantalizing on your roster, but Adam Thielen's still going to be on this roster. Deontay Johnson's still going to be on this roster and they're linked to a ton of different wide receivers that for dynasty purposes, I would hate if it's a Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin, Lad McConkey. If they land with the Panthers at the beginning of the second round, I would hate it. So Mingo, it, the ship has sailed, in my opinion. And I know it's certainly, early. yeah, yeah. But you know, we talk about this all the time. Is like you do want to be aggressive after year one. And again, you're not expecting every player to be a superstar, but you need to look for the warning signs of. Look, if he turns it around, he's in a complete outlier. You know, uh, Devonta Adams did it. But he's also one of the best wide receivers of the last decade, right? So, like, more often than not, if you're just willing to move on when these guys still have, I'm going to use air quotes, value, like, you can get something for them. Sky Moore is a perfect example. Um, Quentin Johnson this year is that guy. Like, it's it's time to do it. And, yeah, you're going to miss every now and then, but you got to capitalize, uh, you know, why you still can. I think there's a very real chance this guy turns into the wide receiver four for the team, assuming they take someone, right? Like, if they take, like you said, Ladd or Worthy or you know, Leggett or whoever in the second round, they're going to give that guy a chance, right, over Jonathan Mingo after what he showed last year with Deontay Johnson and Adam Thielen on the roster. So um, you need all that to go right, and you also need Bryce Young not to be terrible, which it's kind of a big parlay to hit. So I am trying to get anything for Mingo at this point. And players like this clog dynasty rosters because you still see a path, or at least in your mind, that there is upside. So I'm just going to put it to the test. Would you rather have Jonathan Mingo or the because I, I would take a second round pick right now if I knew that. I feel like the price is lower though. Would you take the 301? I would take the 301. Okay, that's kind of where I see him. And you might be saying that's cutting bait too early. It is doing something though, it's actually moving forward as opposed to this asset will only depreciate. And, and I know I'm using a Carolina Panthers example, but Terrace Marshall Jr., year one, bleh. year two, nothing. And if he just held on, no, no one cares to trade for him anymore. It's just not going to happen. So I think <laughs> that's not like... Even, he's not even going to be in the league, man. I know. That's what I'm saying. It's also a chance for me to like four out of the last four shows, I mentioned that guy's name, and he'll probably never be on our show again. I think you'll find a way. Cool. Um, <laughs> I will start us off with the players with the most to lose or gain. And I'm just going to say, I'm pretty sure 
the entire Giants offensive skill position, like the, the whole group could change within a year. The New York Giants have one of the oddest rosters when, you, when it comes to offense for fantasy purposes. Like you just look across the board, you're like, do I want any of these players right now actively on my dynasty roster? So I'm going to ask that before I get into all my really cool stats. But Betts, do you want any Giants player right now? Would you trade for them? Of course, depends on the cost for a guy like Wandale, who I think in PPR leagues, deeper dynasty rosters like could crack as a flex a handful of weeks. Honestly, outside of that, I don't want anyone on the squad. That's the only name that I came up with that I said, okay, I can see a, a window where he's like a wide receiver three in full PPR. I have Darren Waller in a league and I'm just literally saying he doesn't even know what he wants to do. So you as a dynasty manager, if you have any clue about Darren Waller over the next year or two, it's like he doesn't even know. So that feels really up in the air. But I want to paint a picture of the Giants, where they're at offensively, what they could do with the sixth pick, because the mocks have been all over the board. What was Peter Schrager's? They trade up for J.J. McCarthy. Is that what Yeah, it was? he had him going to, going to four with Arizona to go get McCarthy. Okay, so it's it's a odd team because you look at the offensive skill positions and they're not really there. Um, it's weird because they're, they're not, <laughs> I hate saying it. They're not an NFL offense to me. They're like a subcategory. Um, and in order to like, really, if you're the giants, you basically should be recast as the little giants. What kind of play you got for this situation? How about the annexation of Puerto Rico? Brian Dable. Oh man. <laughs> had one year where things just clicked right, for this team two years ago. And then it bottomed out this past year. They were 30th in points per game, 30th in yards per dry, 31st in passing yards per game. I mean, who could forget that game against the Jets where they had negative nine total passing yards? I mean, it was just... That's almost not... Like, that almost feels like something that's just not possible. How does that happen? because they were a JV team. Like, that's what I'm trying to... Rick Moranis should be coaching this team if we're using 90s Disney sports movies but um my question is bets what is this team this is so mean what are they good at offensively i mean it was the the glimmer of hope you had was saquon barkley like maybe he breaks a 50 yarder and that's the highlight um obviously he's gone he's in philly so they don't have anything in my opinion that they are great at offensively especially with the the cast they have right now it's really bad if you look at like advanced metrics you look at expected points added per play they're 29th per pass 28th rush 28th uh yeah the passing game in itself was really really rough and one of the things that the giants maybe you just didn't notice this from just from afar but like they've trailed so many games so the year that they went to the playoff they got really fortunate one score games but the last three years all right first quarter point scored dead last then in Dable's first year, they were 28th. And then last year, they went back to dead last. So they start off games very, very poorly. The only saving grace for this entire football team is they were number one in the NFL in turnover di- differential. So they're, the way that they played was very like Arthur Smith level. It's like, let's control the clock. We can increase variance if we limit the possessions and run the ball and try to do something with this guy named Tommy DeVito who for a hot minute, had his moment of like, oh, this is awesome. This is great. No, no, this is this is nothing. So um, the defense is also, if you look at just how defenses lined up against them, it was a ton of cover three stuff where they said, throw it, throw it deep. Tyrod's the only one that actually had success doing it. Daniel Jones has not been a deep ball thrower the last couple of years. And then the wide receiver room you mentioned. I mean, to borrow a phrase, from trick daddy this is booty do this is terrible this is a terrible 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 wide receiver room and the only people under contract after this year are wandale who has two more years and then jalen hyatt so i'm looking at this roster isaiah mckenzie's on the roster miles boykin uh isaiah hodgins there's nobody here so do you think that they use that six pick on a wide receiver like Neighbors or Dunze, or do they try to, we'll talk about the quarterback position, mix that up? Yeah, it's hard to say because it almost seems like half the mocks you look at 
they are aggressive with McCarthy. And the other half, it's like, you just take neighbors if he's there, assuming Marvin Harrison's already gone. Um, and if I if it was me, I think with the situation, I would take the wide receiver that that is there because of the fact that this team has not had playmakers outside of Saquon, like as a pass catcher, they have not had any playmakers for what, three plus years? Like it honestly feels like since Odell Beckham left, they just kind of been trotting out dudes that really aren't difference makers. And it's tough to win in today's NFL when you don't have playmakers at your disposal. So those guys are, you know, I think everyone has considered them blue chip prospects in this year's class, whether it's the big three of of the wide receivers and there's opinions that are split on McCarthy some people think he is that good and some people think uh he's getting pushed up too much and I think you take the guy that's going to hit for you you know any player can fail of course but more likely to hit for you I think it is the wide receiver this team just needs like a successful first round pick to hit and know that you've got that dude on your team for the next four years which I think one of those wide receivers would be that guy and beyond football you need somebody marketable like yes if you are basically trying to sell to the general public, this is a good offense. I mean, what was the player that you're going to market? Is it Daniel Jones and Devin Singletary? Is it, I mean, if Waller's gone, Daniel <laughs> this Bellinger? Is, this is so depressing, dude. That, that's my point, is that this team is not an NFL team. Like, even just roster-wise, dynasty-wise, fantasy-wise, and marketing well, it's just not there. Um, so I want to finish with Daniel Jones because we don't know if he's going to be the quarterback long term. We don't know if he's going to be the quarterback, you know, past this year. And the conversation last year, and this is more of a dynasty pause teaching moment. The conversation last year was this dude got paid. He got paid, and then Jalen Hurts got paid, and Lamar got paid, and all these other dudes. Really, the deal was like a two year deal. With Daniel Jones, the money, I think it was $180 million, was like the headline that everybody saw. But really, it was a two-year deal. And there are some parts of his contract that next year on the fifth league day, he gets an $11 million fully guaranteed and a $23 million injury guaranteed thing that he got. So there's a lot of vibes here, kind of like Russell Wilson, where oh, we signed this deal. Let's see if it works. Oh, crap, it's not working. Is it time to pivot? And I want to mention that because at this point last year, Daniel Jones in Dynasty Leagues was seen as a top 15 quarterback easy. And with his rushing upside, you could have made the case that he was a fringe top 10 Dynasty quarterback asset. And in Superflex Leagues, people were taking him as their quarterback one. The stat I always bring up when it comes to Superflex and it comes to Dynasty is a third of the league will have a different starting quarterback next year. That is wild to think about. And you usually don't include guys that have a ton of money attached to their name, but Daniel Jones is one of those dudes. Right now, just to kind of give you a feel of how the crowd is feeling, he's no longer the QB15 um, on Keep Trade Cut, which is a good crowdsourced website, not perfect. Uh, he's QB32. So I think people assume that he's not going to be the quarterback, right? With that ADP, I would certainly think so. Yeah, and by the way, Keep Trade Cut is a, is a fine site. It's also very reactionary, and we'll talk about CJ Stroud later. But like, I don't think CJ Stroud should be ranked as the quarterback one. But based on sentiment, it's kind of like where he's at. Um, use crowdsource things, by the way, for Dynasty as not real like values. They're more of just like another way to kind of look and see how how are people feeling or. What's the sentiment? So you couldn't trade Daniel Jones right now in a dynasty league, in my opinion. It's just not worth it. Uh, you probably won't get much in return. And then if you want to trade for him, you're shooting for the upside that they don't take a quarterback and they keep him on his contract. So um, any final thoughts on Daniel Jones, what they're going to do with their draft picks? Yeah, he's he's a guy that I kind of fell into the trap of this last year too. Like like you said, they're like, oh, he got paid. You know, we like Dayball. He can run. It's like the cost isn't that much to go get him. Like I kind of like him as a QB too, but it's a friendly reminder that the NFL moves very quickly. And I think you see this all the time. Like when there's rumblings of like, maybe they move on from this guy, you know, we'll see like the NFL almost always moves on from that guy. As soon as you hear the rumblings, it happens. Right. And I've heard from a couple people that the giants have pretty obvious buyer's remorse on that contract. 
you're already seeing it with the mock draft industry. And a lot of people are saying, you know, if they don't go get one in the top five or six, maybe they just throw a dart on a Penix or a Knicks in round two and, and kind of see what happens there just to give them another out. And like you said, with the Daniel Jones situation, I do think he's probably the starter week one. But with the contract, the way it's laid out, they could be incentivized to sit him over the last month or so, assuming Correct. they have a terrible record, which based off the roster, they probably will. So he's a guy that you can't really do anything right now with because there's no value. There's uncertainty. There's all those things. But if you get positive health reports over the next three months, you get the sense that he is the starter week one. It's immediate sell time for me in Dynasty where it might be your last chance to get out because, like I said, the NFL moves fast. And once these guys lose their starting job, they really don't ever get it back. I mean, unless you're a top 10 guy in the league, like unless you're really Ryan does Tannehill. Moves. <laughs> unless That's you're Ryan Tannehill. That's the one example. Or Baker, I guess. Um, but the NFL moves so quickly today. Yeah. And this, like I said, this is a good case study because every single time somebody gets paid, we go, oh, well, they're locked in. He's a quarterback. Look how much money they owe him. Things can change in the NFL. They change faster than we realize. And so last summer, uh, we talked about Daniel Jones. I remember Jason getting raked over the coals on Twitter by him just saying, Giants fans, like, this is not going to work out well. Um, but instead of just tooting our own horn, it's more of just to say, in super flex leagues, I mean, because in a startup draft, you would have been like, oh, I need I, Daniel Jones. I'm going to take him in round two in a startup super flex league. It, it's, it, it changes way more. So he was in, uh, I, I wrote an article, he was in tier five. I wrote at, he was in at the crossroads where he didn't seem like a locked in player, but like could go either way. So I didn't know that they were going to move on this fast, but super flex rankings are more elusive than people realize. Let's take a quick break and then we'll hear from Brett's. All right, we're back, and Betts is going to talk about his favorite player in the NFL. <laughs> Jason's favorite player, actually. I'm going to bring up the Cincinnati Bengals and the running back situation because you know the NFL draft is only like a week away, and this backfield could be one that you're like, okay, I've got these guys in Dynasty. I'm excited to see what happens this year if they don't take someone. But if they do, Zach Moss and Chase Brown, the value could really fall off a cliff, and What's interesting is, you know, you look at these two players, they're clearly at different points of their career in terms of like where we thought they were. With Chase Brown, he got a little bit of hype coming out of school. I mean, he's a fifth round pick, but everyone was like, they might move on from Joe Mixon in a year or two. And if they do, he could be the guy. And obviously we saw that play out. He was he was interesting from an explosive play standpoint last year. Like he was really good on screens. He could rip off some long runs, those kind of things. So you saw the excitement of like what could happen if it worked out well. The issue was a 34% success rate was atrocious and one of the worst of any rookie in the class. So like from an NFL coaching standpoint, like will they trust that guy to, to get the yards you need? I don't think so, which is kind of why I think they brought in Zach Moss. And when you look at Zach Moss, you might say to yourself, okay, great. Mixon's out of there. He's going to be the RB1. And quite frankly, he was good last year, right? Like no one saw that coming. Almost a 50% success rate, fifth in the NFL in rush yards over expectation per attempts. So like he was great when he got the opportunity, but I would not be surprised. And I don't think anyone should be surprised if in a year we look back and we're like, hmm, remember that little Zach Moss run for eight games in 2023? That was fun. And in a year or two, he's not on the Bengals. He's not really on an NFL team. He's not And in he kind of just falls by the wayside. We see it kind of all the time. Um, and when I look at kind of where he's at, he's 26 years old. You might think to yourself, like, that's not that old. But when you look at, you know, Marv's articles in the Dynasty Pass, which are just awesome, the Dynasty Life Cycles, I love those articles. You look at when running backs actually break out by age, it's almost always by age 24, sometimes age 25, and almost never after this point in a player's career. So anyone that thinks they're getting RB1 Zach Moss that could be a top 24 option, I would bet against it, when, especially when you consider the fact that this team could add someone on day two, maybe day three of the NFL draft uh, to add to the running back room. It's just a player that the archetype you want to bet against more often than not. And I think right now there's a lot of ambiguity about which one do you want? Which one is the guy you need? Who's the better value long term? I think, I think quite frankly, the answer could be neither of these two guys. So it's an interesting backfield because it's a good offense. 
but there's a lot of red flags in both players' profiles when you look at kind of how they performed last year, but also where they're at in their career arc. So I don't know what to do with Zach Moss and Chase Brown in Dynasty. It's one of those backfields that I think I'm trying to look to trade away if I can, especially in the next week, assuming they take someone, you know, day two, day three type of guy. I think you assessed it how I think about a lot where it's, okay, is it Zach Moss or is it Chase Brown? And maybe the answer is just neither of them are going to be super valuable for fantasy. Apart from an injury, it's really hard to be able to forecast and say, this player's going to do this. I've seen so many questions, and I've seen this a couple times on the Ballers Main Show, where people say, why aren't you talking more about Chase Brown? And and it's like, what is there to talk about? Like, like he didn't do anything this past year. He's a fifth round pick. The majority of those times. All yeah. season. I mean, it was it was not good. There's just not a lot to say, like, here's what I should be excited about. Now, in fantasy, anybody who's a running back and is on your dynasty roster is valuable because, yes, you can squint and see the scenario where Chase Brown takes over, Zach Moss gets hurt, and, you know, he's he's explosive, and you get really good opportunity on a really good offense who also just upgraded their offensive line, too. So it's, I could see it, but... Apart from a third round pick, I just can't see myself saying, go get Chase Brown when there's nothing to say that this coaching staff really trust him. And they definitely didn't trust him in pass protection. If you want to go back and look through some of those, I watched some Bengals film and it was okay. They did not trust this guy down, down the, uh, you know, especially the end of the year, uh, where Travion Williams and all these other players that they brought back and they're just said, Hey, we're going to use them. So yeah, I I feel like I'm just hands off on both of those guys and i think right now like you can paint a case for either one which probably tells you like it's a good time to to be out right when you can kind of like squint and see it but oftentimes getting out when there's still perceived value yeah like i said if you miss out and you're like oh you know what zach moss was the rb26 this year did that actually help you (laughs) right probably not right so these are both guys that i'm saying i recommend trading away because people always ask where, where's the love for Chase Brown? Where's the love for Zach Moss? He just signed a new contract. It's two years, $8 million. That's like the lowest end starter money in the NFL. It's not It's not meaningful, right? Like this team has no financial commitment to either guy. So while there is perceived value in the market, I'm trying to, uh, trying to move on. So it, let's say they don't add anybody in the draft. Their value obviously goes up because the perceived, the perception is these are the dudes and you can make your case for Moss. So are you saying like, okay, if you were to wait to trade them, what would you want after the draft? You could probably get a second round pick for either guy after the draft if they don't take someone, which I would take. Right. Especially with the 2025 draft then being so far and so ambiguous in the future, um, it's better to trade then. Or if you're one of those people that just want to wait until you get some juicy camp report that Zach Moss has never looked this good before uh, running around in shorts. The shape of his life, baby he's killing it, then um, you can do that. Let's stay with running back because I've kind of noticed that there is a group of third-year running backs that didn't really have a lot of draft capital spent on them. Like these aren't like first-round dudes at all. And yet we're finding ourselves in year three where they are interesting for fantasy. You probably are looking at every single one of these guys as a potential RB1 for 2024. So I kind of want to like check in with you to see like how secure these players are. And then I'm going to finish by giving a take on Kyron Williams that I have not shared with anybody. Oh, interesting. I know. I'm, I'm kind of glad that Jason's not on this episode because Jason is over the moon for Kyron. And in digging up stats, I've kind of been like, okay, I obviously can see it. He was awesome last year. I'm not going to take anything away. Projecting forward, I kind of have some some fears. So, so you're gonna you're gonna tell us to trade away Kyron Williams? Great, Kyle. I can't wait for that for that dang conversation. It, you just p- put me in a corner of now everyone just <laughs> associates. So um, here's the third year running backs that identified for fantasy that you might think, hey, they could be an RB one this year. Uh, James Cook was a top twelve running back this past year, in air quotes, uh, just because he finished there didn't feel like it. But James Cook entering year three, Rashad White, who was really good for fantasy and really consistent year three, Isaiah Pacheco. Uh, we have him ranked as a top 10 running back for 2024 on the main show right now, which scared the crap out of me. When I was doing the research for that, I was like, 
there is no way this guy feels like an RB1 right now for fantasy, but that's kind of where he lies. Zamir White is a TBD situation because you might say to yourself, I have an RB1 if they don't address the position. And yet, who knows? So he's TBD and then Kyron. So which one of those guys, we'll save Kyron last, which one of those guys stands out to you that you would want to talk about? Um, I think, I mean, it's hard to talk about White, right? Because you just don't know. Right. But I think James Cook is fascinating because everything about like his efficiency and how he's used as a uh, pass catcher, especially when they changed to Joe Brady last year, was awesome. And you're tied to Josh Allen. So it's like, okay, this is great. But this team, you know, was so willing to pull him out for Ty Johnson and Latavius Murray. Like Latavius Murray was the oldest NFL running back last year. And they were like, you know what? Sorry, James, we're inside the 10. Latavius, get in there. Um, And so you're relying on, we like pass catching, obviously, but you're relying on him to still hit big plays. And I fear that for a guy like this, without that locked in goal line role, which by the way, Josh Allen's there, you're never going to get the top tier ceiling that you're hoping for when you have a running back, especially if he is being drafted as a top 12 guy. Yeah, just to give you some numbers, last year he only had five carries inside the five. Josh Allen had 14 of them, and Josh Allen turned them into eight rushing touchdowns. I mean, James Cook has four total rushing touchdowns in two seasons. It's not been great. Uh, Wait, how many? He has four in two seasons. Combined? Combined. Oh, my goodness. I thought you were saying just last year. No, that's it. That's not gross. (laughs) Yeah, so... You can look at this two ways. I've kind of like looked at the arguments and gone, okay, well, he doesn't score touchdowns. That's just who he is. You also could flip it and say, well, he's kind of due for some touchdowns. And, you know, this is kind of the way it works out in fantasy. Either way, I think it's scarier than we realize with these types of players. Because we just saw him put up a top 12 season and you could sell that to anybody in your league. Like, hey, do you see how this guy was utilized with Joe Brady? You know, in those final like seven weeks, like he was targeted on 23% of his routes. That's like awesome for a running back. And he was getting 20 opportunities per game. And this is a Joe Brady offense. And so they want to build around Cook instead of Diggs. But you also can look at this player and just say he's just not built to take a punishing in the NFL. So for him to get like, I would be shocked if he got 20 opportunities per game again this year. It's just not going to hold up. So players like James Cook, I think are kind of at the peak of his value right now. Like, if you have him on your team, you're you're thankful, but I would not feel comfortable going into 2024 with James Cook as my RB1. So I think he's one of those players that you could shop around after the draft if they don't have anyone, or before the draft, you say to yourself, okay, maybe they add somebody else, a bigger back. Like, let's say they added Braylon Allen in the fourth round. Would that terrify you? I think that just tells you that this team would value that type of goal line back, which I mean, that caps the ceiling, obviously, for for Cook. Yeah. So those are the kind of like scenarios we have to think out with these types of players, because, yes, he was taken in the second round. Yes, he had a, a good season. But things shift so fast in Dynasty that if you're holding on to hope, this is just going to be an RB1 for the next two or three years. It's just not going to happen. My case in point was Ramondre Stevenson the year before. You know, he was a fringe RB1. He was awesome if you had him on your team. And going into the next year, he was ranked in our rankings and kind of consensus as like the RB12 in Dynasty. And you're like, oh, sweet. I have an RB1. It's Ramondre. He's the guy this next year. There's no one else on the depth chart. And yet now, like, how do you feel about Ramondre entering year four, his final year in rookie contract? Not great. I mean, but to be fair, obviously the offenses are quite different. (laughs) They were very different uh, with, Stevenson last year and Cook and the Bills. So I think you could kind of see that coming, you know, with the fall off. For sure. It's it's more of looking at that tier that's like, okay, they're really like a third tier in Dynasty. You have like the elite studs, Bijan and Brees, and you know, you have like McCaffrey kind of in that top five conversation. Then you have another group who's young and solid. And then there's this next group. And that's kind of where a lot of these guys, Rashad White, some of the efficiency numbers scare me repeating year over year. I mean, 3.64 yards per carry is the lowest for a top 15 running back over the last five years. I mean, he was RB7. So 
I mean, it was not good. The breakaway runs were also really, really bad. I mean, he was ahead of only A.J. Dillon, Tyler Algier, and Zeke Elliott among qualifying running backs in breakaway percentage. So he's somebody that I... I'll put it this way. Did we just see Rashad White's best season for fantasy of his career? I mean, when you think it's it's a loaded question because you could say that for any running back because the injury rates are so high. He played, Correct. I think he played every game last year, um, and he just saw so much work. So if he misses a couple games, if he just has three or four less opportunities per game, then I think almost certainly. All right, I'll just put it this way: points per game. Do you think that was the best he's ever he will ever do? I would say yeah, probably. Yeah, that's just a bet that I'm willing to make. I know that he's entering year three. And if you're one of those teams that's competing, like don't feel like you have to trade him at all. Like just ride it, get the opportunities. Baker's going to check down a ton. Um, Most routes run among all running backs. Like he's just always out on the field. And Sean Tucker, I don't think he touched the ball after like week eight, something like that. Like they just didn't use him at all. And then they have Chase Edmonds. So maybe they add a back too. It's just a point in a player's life cycle where they're at peak value and you kind of think it's just going to keep like staying steady. I think for a lot of these running backs, you already hit it. So if you can flip them for a first round pick for a needy team, do it. Um, I think you can do it, but let's talk Kyron. That's my, that's my last guy I just want to mention. So what is your, you don't have to give any cool numbers, Beth, but like what's your overall like dynasty vibes with Kyron Williams, third year running back, who was taken in the fifth round uh, out of Notre Dame a couple years ago. Yeah, he's it's so, so wild because you could paint the picture positively or negatively just kind of based off uh, you know, a one-year wonder kind of approach. And I would understand both sides of it and say, like, I could see the outcome. But to me, Kyron's a guy where you almost have to, like, remove the spreadsheet aspect of it what? and remove the, the nerdy aspect of it that you love. And I truly feel that Sean McVay loves this guy. Yes. So I have zero doubts that he is going to get the bulk of the touches, assuming health, you know, et cetera, this year. And his efficiency stuff was pretty good last year. So I think he is locked in for this year. I don't know what after this year holds. So from a dynasty standpoint, if someone wants to capitalize on the value which he carries right now, I get that. If you're a contender, though, I'm riding it out with Kyron. He's one of those players where if I have him in redraft this year, I'll be like, sweet, let's go. In Dynasty, I feel terrified because there's so many scenarios of how this could turn out. You were right. Like, McVay has always been a one-back guy, you know, all the way back to Gurley. You know, even Darrell Henderson had a period where he did that, Cam Akers. It's kind of been he's the dude. I want to give you some numbers for Kyron because he scored a lot of touchdowns and by a lot, like, maybe a little too much, all right? It was 15 touchdowns in, you know, very few games. 37% of his fantasy points came via touchdown. Okay. 37% of the fantasy points. It's a lot. Since 2018, the average for a top 12 running back is 29%. So he was well above that. But I looked at all the running backs who finished as an RB1 and 35 or more percent of their, of their fantasy points came via touchdown. What did they do the next year? All of them dropped in fantasy points per game, except for one. It was Derrick Henry. And the average decline was over four fantasy points per game. So I think touchdowns wise, it's going to be really hard to repeat 15 or whatever. You know, I think he was at 15. Like, it's just, it's hard for me to see that. So right now he's kind of seen as a top five dynasty running back. Are you okay with that ranking? I think so. I think... Just just because the value he could give you this year, I think you kind of have to put him there. But like I said, I see the path where like he maybe he does regress a little bit this year, or he doesn't score 15 touchdowns, or you know whatever the number was. And then you're like, hmm, he was good, but he wasn't a difference maker for me. And then the value will drop off. So I get it, but I do think he deserves to be ranked there. He's one of those players that they could add another running back in the draft because oh by the way, the Rams finally have draft picks uh, that they could actually use. But he's one of those players where I can invest for one year. But if you're thinking this is going to be a long-term three to four year asset, I think you're, you're insane. Like it it could run out. You could get one good year and then that's it. But maybe in dynasty, that's all you need. Like you want to go for a championship. You will have to pay though. Like this isn't an opportunity where you're going to have to like buy someone under value. Like right now, what would you think in rookie picks it would cost to get him? I think you have to give a top five pick. 
Oh, certainly. For what he did last year, you you definitely would have to do that. Which, I mean, this whole conversation is just... I mean, I feel like I always come on the show, I'm like, trade away your running backs, trade away your running backs, right? Like, this... Whenever a running back peaks in value, it's a good time to trade them. Just because the position changes so quickly, and that's that's just something I'll always approach with Dynasty... And more often than, than not, you're going to be right and you're going to recoup value. And that's how you keep your rosters turning over year over year is just when that guy is peak value, you trade him away, you get someone else, you know, you get a rookie pick on top of that. You kind of just keep replenishing your running back room. And, and that's kind of the way I've always played Dynasty. So Kyron is one of those guys. If, if I don't view my team as a top, I would say three team this year, like I definitely have a shot to win. I am certainly shopping him to a contender and just trying to get a haul for him. Because like you said, there is a path where a year from now, two years from now, you look back and you're like, dang it, I, I missed the window. Right. And maybe you missed out on one elite year, but then you're able to recoup it and you actually do get value. You know, you actually get a top five pick where let's say it's the 104. You're like, I get a Dunze. Sweet. Like that. That's that's helpful for my team and being able to move forward. Let's take a quick break and then we will just torture ourselves talking the Chargers. <laughs> Let's talk about the Chargers. I know that they're a team that if you watch them, and I've watched a lot of Chargers games the last couple of years, painful. Just just inviting pain into your life. And the best part is, I know that the people listening here, there's maybe one or two Chargers fans because they barely exist. They are rare. Um, so, Betts, uh, talk to me about the Chargers. <laughs> that was the old Chargers, Kyle, okay? This is going to be different with Harbaugh and, and you know Roman. I don't think they might win some games. But to me, the players that have the most to gain and lose over the next week is just the, the passing attack, right? And we need to you know, set the stage. We talked about this team a lot already. People know they're going to run the ball. That's Harbaugh's DNA. They're going to play good defense. It's not going to be the up-tempo, high-flying chargers of the last three or four years where they just throw all the time. But there is a situation where this team adds Marvin Harrison Jr. And then you're like, whoa. I'm I'm excited about Justin Herbert, right? He gets a true alpha, a guy that could be a perennial pro, pro Bowl player, or they could bypass the position entirely in round one and take someone in round two that you're like, I guess I could see it work out for Leggett. You know, I guess I could see it work out for Corley. Those kind of fringe guys that you're like, I don't really know. And when you look at historically under Harbaugh, I went back with his time in San Francisco. This was 2011 to 2014. And it's different roster and, you know, different needs at the time and different things. But they spent a first round pick on a wide receiver just once that was pick 31 with AJ Jenkins. Truthfully, I didn't even know who that was. Um, And they're almost a high state guy. And they're almost always investing early under Harbaugh in those years with edge players, safeties, you know, defensive ends, stuff like that. Drafting running backs in round two. Illinois. Which they could certainly do this year. I'm thinking of Michael Jenkins. Uh, Illinois wide receiver Illinois Illinois finest AJ Jenkins um and those were teams that had like Michael Crabtree and they had a dominant tight end you know and Vernon Davis so like it was a very different makeup but just historically that's not what they've done are they picking at this spot again in a year or two I think Harbaugh and, and company would certainly hope not so do you just get one of these wide receivers that are truly elite and then everyone that's freaking out about Justin Herbert's like oh you know what he's got Marvin uh, Marvin Harrison he's great he's got Malik neighbors he's great And it really just has a trickle down effect on how you view this team because, you know, the concerns I think for Herbert are real with a volume standpoint. But right now, when you look at the depth chart, you're like, how can he get it done with this team? But if he has one of those blue chip guys as his number one, you're excited about him again in Dynasty, I think. So this is a team that I'm just fascinated to see what they do. Do they trade down? Do they stay pat? And, And, you know, just where do they go? Because this team has many holes to fill on offense. And looking at the depth chart right now, it's Quentin Johnson. Josh Palmer, Darius Davis, Simi Fihoko, I think I'm saying that right. I don't even know. And Pokey Wilson. Like Those are the five wide receivers on their team. It is just an absolute train wreck. So they're adding someone. The question for Herbert and, and the offense is just how good is that guy that they're adding? You didn't even mention Will Disley. How dare you? Well, he's just going to be blocking. He's only going to run two, two routes this year. I saw an interview with him where he was just smiling, just like so happy. And I'm like, dude, it's because you got paid a ton of money from this team that just like out of nowhere said, we want you on the team. Dude, and the Seahawks gave him a ton of money a couple of years ago. Hey, good for him. Good for Will Disley. Uh, the problem with the Chargers and the problem with this team 
is that they might be successful doing it. That's like the, the most frustrating thing for fantasy purposes. We brought this up a couple of times, but Greg Roman's teams have been super successful. I mean, Harbaugh was successful basically everywhere, uh, but Roman's teams average double digit wins and those were in like 16 game seasons. So yeah, I think this team next year, they won't be drafting up at the top. So I don't know, right now you're a betting man. We will do this, a betting mock draft on this week's DFS and betting episode, but Give me your early pick five, what the Chargers do. I mean, I think the most likely scenario is this team moves back with with Minnesota just because there was reports pretty early on, like even before the Vikings had multiple picks of like they might be willing to move back and just accumulate picks and get a tackle or you know someone like that, get an edge player and just keep building. So I think that's probably what they do, but it's going to be a fascinating situation if if Arizona is the team that trades and they're just sitting there with Marv staring them in the face and it's yep. like this guy could be every year a Pro Bowl player and you're just going to pass on him like that to me would seem wild. I'm so excited for Marvin Harris. I, I I showed my kids highlights the other day. Anyway, Marvin Harrison Jr. And I mean, Harbaugh saw him up close and personal against Ohio State, right? Like he knows how good that guy is. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's going to be great. Uh, the Chargers are a team though that there could be some value but it might not be players currently on the team that you want to be investing in. Uh, don't Correct. go after Joshua Palmer, you know, those kind of things. Like just, you can figure it out. I'm interested in the running back and who they take. Cause I think they're going to be taking one um, probably pick like 69 if they don't trade somewhere, but like that, that's a good spot uh, for one of the running backs. Let's hop into the mailbag. Mailbag. I am pulling these questions from our discord because those people are just amazing. Our Dynasty Keeper channels, Dynasty Superflex, Dynasty Trade Advice. There are people talking Dynasty stuff all the time. If you want to go to ballersdiscord.com, if you are a Join the Foot member, you get instant access to that. You get to talk to us. We hop in there. So this first one is from Arion115. How much do you let positional team need determine who you take in the draft? Bets, you go first. So I assume this is talking about uh, rookie picks but it's a, it's a year by year situation for me where if you feel strongly about you know two different uh players two different positions and you have a clear need I'm okay addressing that need if it's in the same tier the same group of players the area where you get in trouble is like you know we've said this years ago where you go get Samaj P Ryan in round one because he's a running back and he went to a good spot I've been there but he wasn't that good, right? It's like, what are we doing here? And I know the Jahan Dotson year two experience was abysmal, but he was another guy that was like, what, the 16th overall pick or something in the NFL draft. And he kind of fell to the back of round one because of other more sexy picks in round two that people liked or running backs people liked. So this year specifically, I think you're getting that question a lot because it's like, I have the 101 or the 102. Like, I love Marvin Neighbors, but like, I really need a quarterback. Like, is it okay to not take those guys and take Caleb Williams, you know, those situations. And I think in that specific super flex lens, if you do need a quarterback that badly, I think it's okay. I would not take someone like JJ McCarthy over one of these top three wide receivers because you need a, a quarterback. I think there's a yes. very clear gap in the talent there and the, the outlook. So um, I think it's okay depending on the year and, and where you're at in the draft. You can also kind of look at it and say, okay, I'm looking at this pick through positional team need, but I also could look at it in the lens of what has value a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. And we know that young wide receivers generally do. So if you're going back and forth, I kind of have like a list where I'm first going to look at talent and let that be the, this is the deciding factor. What do I think about this player? What do I think about them? And, you know, I'm going to look at it from an analytics point of view. You know, if you're putting up this, these types of numbers in college against zone, you're probably going to crush the NFL. If you get early draft capital, then you can kind of look at team opportunity and landing spot. And we talked about that on the rookie tips and tricks, like for wide receivers, it doesn't matter as much for running backs. It matters way more. Then I kind of look at like historically what have players done who are picked here. And then the very end, I'm going to look at team need. The only caveat I will give is in super flex, but let me give you some names. Okay. In 2021, there was a draft where if you really, really, really needed a quarterback, and you were in a super flex league. You said, well, I mean, Trevor Lawrence, Trey Lance, Justin Fields. I will take them over Jamar Chase. 
That's just pain. Even (laughs) even in Superflex, like the value's not there. What about, man, I really need a running back here. I'm going to take Trey Sermon over Jalen Waddell, an example we've brought up many, many times. Or even the crazier one, just to hold on to, is I need a tight end. I'm taking Kyle Pitts over Jamar Chase and Devonta Smith. Because that's what happened. Like People saying, I don't have a tight end in my roster. So I'm using that same thing this year because if you don't have an elite tight end, it's going to be very easy to say, I'm going to take Brock Bowers at 104. And I think that is just way too early. And when I look at how tight ends accrue value, it just doesn't really happen. Like, like even TJ Hawkinson, who's been a very good pro, was taken in the first round. You wouldn't say that TJ Hawkinson has always just been this, you know, major value. Like, I have to trade for him. He's awesome. He's been good, but not somebody that's like a cornerstone for fantasy. Yeah, and there was like a couple years where you were like, is it really going to happen? You know, like the first year or two, you're like, he's been okay. Like, I, I don't see the ceiling. And then, of course, I mean, with most tight ends, it takes a while, right? So that's kind of what you see. So, yeah, I think if you are thinking about it just from a, you know, a, a pick that's not just going to completely flame out in a year and you lose all the value of the player you took, I think it's like a clear situation where these wide receivers, even if it doesn't go great, you'll still have a chance to to trade them away next year. I think that's probably true as well for the top two maybe quarterbacks in this class like Caleb Williams even if he has a mediocre year people are going to be excited about Caleb Williams next year we did it with Trevor Lawrence right like these guys will have value again next year I I do try to think about that more now than I used to of like not only like how does this help me now but also how does this help me in the trade market you know in a year yeah yeah it's looking at players with a couple different things in mind so you don't approach a pick with one question or one tweet you know, like, oh, I saw this one tweet and one graph that someone sent out, and therefore, this is what I'm looking at a player. Like, no, all of these players are nuanced. We could look at A.D. Mitchell. I could give you 30 terrible stats, and I can give you probably like 10 good ones. The, the bad ones kind of outweigh, but you get the point. Uh, next question from Push the Pigskin, who has a Falcons logo avatar here. Uh, great person. How do you all approach trading picks during a startup draft? Do you like trading out of the first pick? to get multiple picks in the third to sixth round, three, third through sixth round, or do you try to trade back into the first? What do you think, Betts? So this one, you know, the trading in the startup draft is always very fun, especially when you're thinking about startup picks. But oftentimes, unless you are getting an absolute haul to move back, I'm staying there and taking someone yes. to build around in Dynasty, especially in the first two rounds, because those are the dudes. Like those, that's Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Amon Ross St. Brown, Brees Hall, right? The list kind of goes on and on. But there does get to a point where you're like, oh, man, you know, I've got a couple extra thirds here. I've got an extra sixth. Like, this could really be a good value. And then when you put names to it and you actually look at who's on the board, you're like, I would never actually do that trade in a real, you know, if you already have your team, a real trade back and forth. You would never make those players, you know, a, a trade like that. So it has to be a haul. You have to get someone to really overpay, in my opinion, to move back. Yes. And, and Jason approaches this the same being in a couple of startups with him over the years. It's like you want to trade up, you want to get the multiple first rounds. If you're going to do something, it's just not worth it when you look at the players. So let's say you trade it up and you got Jamar Chase and AJ Brown and you're like, oh crap, I don't have a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round pick. And then you look at who's taken there. Like you mentioned, you're like, do I really care if I got Curtis Samuel in the seventh? Like it, it right. just doesn't, it doesn't really move you that much. So You'd rather trade up. The value's not there moving down. Uh, This one's from Noggin on Discord. Does Trevor Lawrence ever level up to an upper tier quarterback? And I think we might need to define what we mean by upper tier. So how would you define that? I think for fantasy, you're talking about, like, when I think about difference makers in at quarterback in fantasy, it's like, it's really the top five guys. Yes. The guys that give you that massive ceiling and, you know, the ability to win a week, win a year. I do not ever see that for Trevor Lawrence. You know, he's been in the league long enough that you kind of have to just believe who he is. And, you know, Calvin Ridley, he was okay last year. He had some ups and downs. I don't think losing him really helps, right? You're getting Gabe Davis, who's wildly inefficient. As it stands right now, they could take someone around one, but as it stands right now, they're counting on Zay Jones to be an every down player. You know, there's there's holes you can poke in his fantasy outlook. I think Trevor Lawrence still is going to be a pro, a good pro in the league for a while. But really, to me, it's like if he finishes as the quarterback nine and the quarterback 13, then the quarterback 15, then the quarterback 10, like it's fine. 
but he's not really winning your league. And I don't think he I, he really has that ceiling anymore the way that people probably thought he had you know, previously. And there's a big difference between having an elite season. I think he could have one. Like it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility that touchdowns go his way and being in the elite tier. I do not think that he can land in that elite tier of being a top five dynasty quarterback. And I looked this up since 2015. Now, actually, let's go to 2014 so we can include Blake Bortles in there. If you haven't hit 19 plus fantasy points per game, which is kind of like on that top five fringe uh, number you were given. If you haven't hit 19 fantasy points per game in a season by year three, it's just probably not going to happen for the most part. Like there's a couple outliers here and there if you can really like jump in. So Dak was really good, but he became great in his fourth year. Uh, and you've seen another great season this past year. So Dak's kind of an outlier. Jared Goff had a great year three. And yet we haven't really thought of him being a great player. Uh, Blake Bortles actually had a great year in year two. Remember that outlier year? Um, sure do. I want to, I want a title with him that year. So props to him, but it never really, you never really thought of him as being an elite tier player. So I would say with Trevor Lawrence, it's just not going to happen. You know, it, over time we kind of see like, remember his rookie year was abysmal, just like one of the worst ever. Then the last two years has been fine. 17.4 points, 17.3 I think at the end of the day, he's a QB two, and you thought you were going to get a locked in top eight type dynasty quarterback, but he's he's a QB two right now. Well, the thing that's um, so tough about quarterbacks, right, is like not to cut you off, the top guys like are the top guys every year, right? It's it's Jalen Hurts, it's Josh Allen, it's Lamar Jackson, it's you know when Kyler's healthy, it's Kyler, it's Mahomes, like those are the guys, and like it's really hard for those guys to fall off outside of injury, so it's hard for guys to make that leap. So I think when you see it, like I said, who a player is, that's probably who he is, which is a fringe, you know, top 12 guy. Yeah. And like I said, he has a chance at an elite season, but I would not put him in that elite tier by any means. A um, couple more questions here, Bets, from Jason's Black Polo on Discord. You're on the clock at 102 in a startup. It's a super flex league. Are you going Stroud if he's there? And I wrote a quick answer. It's called heck no. <laughs> I mean, I get it, right? Like he showed you everything you're looking for last year. This team adds Stefan Diggs, replaces Noah Brown with Stefan Diggs. Um, so I understand the hype and the excitement. To me, I would not because there's still two quarterbacks that I would certainly have over him in Dynasty super flex leagues, you know, that format that I take there. One of them is Jalen Hurts, the other one is Josh Allen. So I'm not taking him at one oh two. Yep. I'm taking one of those two players. You could talk me into Mahomes too. Uh, if you just want longevity. Um, yeah, it, it, the thing with Stroud is we loved him. And it feels weird to be on this side of Stroud that we're like, okay, I, I don't really like how hyped up it is because in some places he is the quarterback one. I mentioned keep trade cut and their rankings. He's their quarterback one based on the crowdsource stuff, which is just all sentiment. And I think when you come down to real numbers, like CJ Stroud had like five really good fantasy games last year. That's it. And the rest were just, okay, so there's a lot of projection you're still adding in there. Um, the wide receivers will look different. Like, we don't know with Nico, this is his final, final year. Diggs, pretty sure it's his final year. So, it, like, I don't know. Like, is it is it weird to look at this roster and be like, oh, look at these wide receivers, and then a year or two from now, it's just Tank running around, and then they have somebody else? I think it's possible. I mean, like you said, part of the trade and part of the situation with Diggs was that they – voided the last couple of years of his deal so they could resign him but then he's another year older and there's certainly a chance he goes elsewhere next year too so yeah I, I see the path there and then nico like you said is a free agent after the season too so that is certainly possible and the th the tricky thing with stroud is that you know when he's a rookie and what he did he exceeded expectations beyond what you could have even hoped for when you took him in a rookie draft or something like that but now when you're talking about him as a top five startup pick the expectations are this guy's going to be elite for years to come. And with, you know, pocket passers, we just see the ebbs and flows. It's kind of touchdown based. Like Joe yes. Burrow could be a top five guy. He could also be the, the quarterback 12, right? And no one would be surprised by that. So I think that's kind of what you're looking for with Stroud, where it's up and down a little bit. And he has those outlier years where he's incredible. He might regress for a year and, and things change. So, 
yeah, that's just a player that I think is overvalued in a startup situation. I mean, he probably deserves to go somewhere in the back of the first round, I think, but I would not be taking him at 1.02. Yes, I, I think it's it's a, he might be better in real life than he will be in fantasy, which some players, that's how they exist. And it's okay to be able to say that and recognize it. But yeah, I think he's more of a back of the first in a super flex startup for me. And, and he'll just never go there. People are going to be taking him as a top five pick over and over and over again. Would you rather have Lamar or CJ Stroud in yeah, D- Dynasty Superflex startup? Lamar. Just, I, would, I mean, the rushing upside is just unreal. I would too. And I don't know if that's a popular opinion, but fantasy-wise, fantasy points per game, rushing, all that stuff, um, I think I'd rather have that too. That's going to do it for this episode. Next week, we will be giving our last-minute thoughts on the NFL draft, maybe our hopes, our dreams of what we want to happen. And then, yes, next Thursday, if you didn't hear, we will be live on NFL Plus. Uh, Footballers will be doing a end of first round draft show. We'll be talking through what happened, what it means for fantasy. I've been digging up some dirty, dirty dynasty thoughts. You know, some some would call it some nasty stuff uh, to be able to talk and talk through all these players. So uh, we will talk to you again next week. Bets, tell everyone bye. Yes, hope everyone has a great week. I think corporate's going to be back with us next week. We'll see, but enjoy the week. NFL Draft is almost here. I'm so excited. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. If you want to take your dynasty skills to the next level, check out the fantasyfootballers.com.